welcome back students in the last class we were we just started with the fourth unit and we had uh, discussed about the main memory so let's go through what we have discussed in the last class and then continue our lecture so in the last class we saw the background swapping uh, contiguous memory allocation segmentation paging structure of the page table or the contents of this unit so the first part of your unit so what is the background so we have understood that there is memory uh, main memory in the main memory in the sense we are talking about the ram and in ram we keep operating system and other user processes so we have to take care that the pro uh, processes are loaded into ram when the process needs execution or before the cpu executes this process it has to be in the ram why it has to be brought into the ram because cpu can only access the various uh, resistors that are there along with it in the central processing unit and the ram it can only access ram it cannot access the secondary storage device your disk directly to access the disk it has to go through the operating system so it has to inform the operating system to load the file that is there on your secondary storage device into the ram so that the cpu can work on that so you cannot directly access the cpu cannot directly access the secondary storage device so all your processes the programs that you have stored on your hard disk needs to execute means they have to be brought into the main memory of your ram in uh, in the right sense if we say it's the ram in which we have to load the memory program and once the program is loaded into the ram the program becomes a process and that process execution begins when the cpu's attention is given to that process so this is what we saw uh, so we saw that uh, the there is a single cycle that is required to access the resistors of your central processing unit whereas it requires multiple cycles to access a memory location on your ram but it cannot access the secondary storage device so it takes more time to access the ram than your second uh, than your resistors i told you that to uh, reduce the time that is required to access an instruction from the secondary storage device sorry from the ram we need another additional memory so that whatever is frequently accessed from the ram is placed in that location but not in the resistors the instructions are all asked to show in that resistor uh, in that memory what is that memory called we have the cpu then the 1 to 31 0 to 31 32 Uh, general purpose resistors you have other resistors like uh, program counter we have the we have the limit resistor we have some other resistors as well into the system so this is so this is the central processing unit where you have all these resistors and your central and your processor this is the processor and we have a ram so from the ram for execution and i told you that it takes too many cycles of cpu time clock time for accessing one instruction from the ram so we a small and very fast memory is here what is that that is cache memory so the cache memory uh, makes an interface between your processor and the ram so that whatever is accessed frequently that is put into the cache and that is used by your cpu <coughs> in system you'll have various types of cache l1 cache l2 cache and all that so you all can study that in detail by yourself because it is beyond the scope of this syllabus but you have like this cache and these cache can be multiple to access the data from the ram so this is what we have seen in the last class so that's what is here cache is between the main memory and the cpu resistor and you need to take care of the protection so i told you that there will be os then there will be processors p1 p2 so on in the ram so if p2 instructions are getting executed you should take care that 
P2 does not access any other memory location. It should only access this part of the memory that is allocated to it. So that is what is the task of the operating system and that is what is main memory management techniques. So uh, we have understood that various user processes along with operating system is stored in your main memory and for taking care of the protection that one process does not access any other process or the uh, CPU's memory location, we have the base resistor holding the base address and the limit resistor holding the limit with which it can access. So it can only access this memory location beyond this memory location and within the addition of these two. Only that much memory is belonging to this process. Similarly, there is a limit and base resistor which is holding the details of this. So when this process is, uh, starts execution, the base resistor and limit resistor's values will be updated according to this process. So there will be base resistor and the limit resistor in your uh, central processing unit which will take care of holding these memory locations and whenever the CPU instruction tells that you need to access this memory location or particular memory location in this process and get that information or that instruction, it will first check whether it is within this memory location. If it is within this memory location, then only it will allow you to access. So that is what we have seen in the next diagram that there is a condition whether the address that the CPU is trying to access is greater than the base resistor and less than the base plus limit resistor. If it is within that memory location, that means it's a valid uh, uh, reference or the valid request of data or instruction. So the information is fetched from the memory and sent to the CPU. Otherwise, it will generate a trap. Trap is nothing but a uh, error signal that is generated by the operating system and operating system takes care of how to handle this issue. So it generates an issue, uh, raises an exception and it stops the execution of that process there itself. We also saw address binding. So there are various uh, ways of binding addresses and uh, this happens at various stages. So you will be having, uh, last class I have that you all will write programs like for example you'll write a program for addition of two numbers as uh, int a is equal to 5 comma b is equal to 10 then you all can say that uh, int c c is equal to a plus b and then you all will say print f percentage d comma so this is how you all will write your program but what happens here is that uh, let me switch on the lights I think it will not be visible I hope the board is visible now. So I was telling that we write program like this. This is a high level language program. This is a source code. And this file will be stored on your secondary storage device. You'll compile it and when you'll compile it, you'll will get a EXE file. So this is symbolic names. So right now in the source code, you have the symbolic names. This symbolic names are the names that will be memory location, the location where 5 is stored, we name it A and and we are understanding it with the symbolic names. When you compile the program, before you compile the program, uh, before you before you compile, you all will uh, actually first check, you, uh, it's actually linking, uh, compiling only, but for compiling also has various phases, it has 7 phases and in that 7 phases, it takes the symbolic names, converts them to memory locations, that is uh, locations which is called as uh, relocatable addresses. It means, uh, for example, here you have A. So we say that this is your program. 
इंस्ट्रक्शन थी अलाइव ओनली टू want to have it clear understanding so these are the memory locations now wherever c a b and all is there c is location so set the location zero for after four bytes so zero so we will convert this program the same program when you write an exe 16th bit is equal to location add the value that is there at 8th bit to the value that is there at 12th bit save that into 16th bit location so this is what is the relative addresses why we call them relative because we don't know where it is going to get loaded in memory so we call them as relative so it starts from 0 and goes on to 16 but when you load this into your main memory it will be loaded so that program is loaded in p1's location and p1's location starts from 20048 so 20488 will be the which is nothing but 16 is equals to 8 plus 12 okay then the next instruction that only instead it will be better in bit is equal to this is stored at this location 16 is equals to 8 plus and instruction will be stored at uh, the next fourth bit that is 40 station you all will have the next instruction print it print it 16 whatever is the value that is stored at memory location 16 and Then 52 so will be two double good so uh, you have to store the addition which is 15. what is this this is absolute addresses means this is the actual addresses and these are all relative addresses 16 8 12 they are relative from the beginning of the program where your process is loaded so this is relative addresses and this is absolute addresses so that is what we are having here so we have symbolic names we have uh, okay let's go through the statements one by one programs on a disk ready to be brought into memory to execute from an input queue so first of all the programs that are ready to be brought into the uh, memory for execution is is put into the input queue and from the input queue your dispatcher selects the process and brings it into the ram for execution so without support must be loaded into the address double triple zero so it should be every process actually uh, assumes that it will be loaded at the at starting address at zero 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 but not at zero 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 because wherever there is free space in your ram there it will be loaded so it cannot be always at zero zero and one more thing is the operating system operating system is either stored in the lower bit address or in the higher bit address means at the lowest lower level of the op ram or in the beginning of the ram so either of the two places the operating system is stored most of the op systems 
uh, 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 like to keep it at the lower address bit not at the higher address bit okay so inconvenient to have first user process physical address always at 000 because most of the time the operating system is there at location so further address represented in different ways at different stages of the program's life cycle in the source code it is symbolic in compiled uh, code addresses bind to relocatable addresses so this is called as a relocatable addresses relocatable addresses and this is called as a absolute addresses so when it is loaded into the system it is called as uh, absolute address so linker arm loader will bind relocatable addresses to absolute addresses so there is what 74014 uh, similarly you will have 2048 as a absolute address so when the linker and loader loads your programs into your uh, main memory that time you all will get the absolute addresses so each binding maps one address space to another address so we also saw uh, that bindings we had a uh, compile time we have load time and we have execution time now compile time this is what is compile time so when you all compile you will get this addresses but when you all will use a loader to load this the loader will also have uh, it is based on either it is a dynamic loader or it is a static loader a static loader is the one which will when you all first time load the entire program it will have the actual address is put in and it will store there so that time what happens is if the once the program is put into a particular memory space every time you load that program you remove it from the main memory and put it back into the main memory for some reasons then you will have to load it in the same memory location because that addresses are static addresses but if you have dynamic binding or a dynamic loader then you will uh, have the addresses which are relocatable so once you can put it into the first uh, slot then you can put it into the third slot or you can put it into the fifth slot because the addresses can be changed at the time of execution so that is why it is called as dynamic loading so uh, you have compile time so when we compile a program you will get uh, addresses allocated by the compiler the names will be converted to numbers these a b c all names will be converted to addresses so this address location is given by compiler so then after that there is load time the loader is who when you tell an exe to be executed double click on that exe that time the loader will bring that program and put it into the ram and indicate to the cpu that this program is ready for execution and the cpu will be allocated to that program by the operating system so that is when the loader gives the addresses so loader gives it to addresses based on where it is getting loaded so that is loader's addresses then you have execution time addressing so execution time addressing is the addressing that happens when in dynamic so if you remove the process and again put it back that time it becomes a dynamic binding so these are the different times when addresses get changed so it is either compile time it is load time and it is execution time we have understood that with this diagram in the last class we saw that source program is given for compiling compiler creates an object module the object module is uh, then all your header file uh, are load uh, our libraries are uh, the static libraries are linked to the linker editor will add the two module and the object uh, the built in object it will add and it will create the load module and the load module is given to the loader it adds the system libraries to it and it will so those modules can be user modules only which are at different files in different files so it will load all those and it will link all those and then the loader will load the system libraries and then that all together dynamic loaded whatever dynamic libraries are be added it will be added at run time and this is what is the execution time function so the entire program is the simple program that you have written get three inputs it will be the other modules of your program it will be system libraries and it will be dynamically loaded system libraries all those will together form your entire exe program and that exe program is executed and not necessary that it entire exe program is loaded into the ram it can be loading only the part of the memory was the program which is getting executed right now the module that is required only that can be executed so like so there are various uh, techniques like that we will see that in the uh, in this class today only so logical versus physical address space 
so logical address space is generated by the cpu also referred to as virtual addresses and physical addresses is what is present in the ram so this is logical address uh, sorry this is uh, the yeah logical address which is the uh, virtual addresses and this is the physical addresses so the logical address to the logical address we add the base register information whatever is the base uh, limit uh, base register so the base register is 20048 so that is added to your uh, particular the thing so you all will get this address so that's how you all will get the absolute addresses or the uh, physical addresses so this logical address space is set by logical address generated by program and physical address space is generated by your physical addressing of your program when it is loaded so that there is a difference when it is generated it is either generated at load time or it is generated at compile time so memory management unit mm uh, mmu takes care of binding this logical address to physical address i told you, you know if i add 16 to 48 i will get the location where the addition value should be stored so this is logical address this uh, this is your virtual address so that virtual address we have to add the the base address to get the physical location so that is what is the task done by mmu the mmu not only adds this base register to your relocation register and it creates your it generates your physical address but it also checks whether you are accessing a valid location or no so this technique was used by uh, ms dos intel 8086 uh, and it used four relocation registers to take care of different uh, four different programs simultaneously next is dynamic linking uh, so this is what i explained you all that the cpu generates the logical address the logical address is added to your base register and it will then access the memory but before accessing the memory it checks whether you are accessing the valid address or no and then only allows you to access that memory location so this is what we have seen in the last class we also saw what is dynamic linking so what is dynamic and static linking static linking means if during the compile uh, when you compile and you are loading the program if you generate the uh, relocatable addresses and if you keep them static if you keep them constant then that means that they are static binding but dynamic line, uh, binding means if during the execution time you can change the addresses of your program all the uh, the locations of a b and c so this time i have loaded it here next time uh, in in a little time before i go for print i before i go for printing uh, maybe i will be stopped for execution i'll be removing this program and putting it back and when i put it back i don't put it at this location i put it on some other location that time the address is again have to be changed so that is called as dynamic linking so dynamic linking is when you are linking the addresses when you are having changes in your program done all the memory locations you are updating based on the execution time that time it is called as dynamic binding so dynamic linking linking is postponed until execution time small piece of code a step is used to locate the appropriate memory register the library routing so here printf is not loaded if you see printf is required now for execution what has to be done what is printf when printf comes cpu should know what has to be done actually it is an um, module it is a program it's a function which tells the operating system that it wants to use the screen to display the values right so that is that task is there in the printf so printf has to be loaded into the memory when printf is called so this loading is done by using the stub so if you are loading during the uh, when the first time you say execute the program that time only if the printf also is added to this code and it is loaded then it is called a static binding but if the printf is loaded when you require printf to use then it is called as dynamic linking so that dynamically you will uh, load the method and you all will link this call to that function module and cpu will jump to that location and start execution of the instructions from that function so that is called as this thing so for that you have a stub so the stub has uh, it is like a small uh, the thing so here like for example we have printf this printf is like a stub it gives the address of where the printf is in the system it will load that the thing 
uh, module into the ram and then cpu jumps to that location where this uh, printf function is loaded instructions are loaded and it starts executing those instructions so that is called as dynamic linking so you have a stub the stub is all uh, it will have an address or it can have the entire routine so if it is having the entire routine then it means that it is static if it is not having the routine it will have the addresses so stub replaces itself with the address of the routine so here in stub printf it will uh, have the address of so if printf function is loaded at 20068 then that printf this printf will be replaced by 068 so cpu will simply jump to this location and it knows that it has to print c's value which is this memory location it takes that information and it prints the value on the screen so that is what is dynamic linking so dynamic linking you can also have shared libraries wherein more more than one uh, program can process can access the shared libraries uh, then we have a, we had started with swapping so let's start and understand swapping we have understood that into the ram so if this is our ram and this is so we need to get program from your secondary storage device all your programs you store in your secondary storage in your c drive d drive all those drives right so you get from those drive you when you say execute or open a file that file has to be brought into the ram for execution or opening for you all to access that file so when we are bringing that program into the ram we also sometimes will have to remove it from the ram this process is called as so swapping is a process of getting a program into the uh memory so initially you get the program into memory but later during some during the various reasons you have to remove the process from the cpu put it into the location wherein it is uh, extended ram this is called as extended it is called the virtual memory extended ram or virtual memory so we will uh, get the program from your hard disk to your ram so from so first step is to get your program into your ram when it is in execution some from in the middle of the execution this program is not running right now it is in waiting state and there is no space and this is waiting another program you ask the operating system to execute there is no space to bring a new program into the system so what it does is into your virtual memory free space after this program 2 i execute and finishes or it may be go it may go on a halt for some reason so that i will again be brought into memory so that's how process out is process 2 so then process 1 does its execution maybe it will finish execution and it will in process 2 which is waiting in extended memory will to 
will start its execution one can i am explaining you with the same memory location but not necessary that you swap in into the same memory location you can swap into other memory locations also best example for this is supposing if we are having a round robin scheduling cpu scheduling where multiple processes are kept into the system and cpu is located on supposing if there are p2 so on till p10 and 10 processes need to be executed by the cpu one after the other not all 10 can fit into the memory then what you will do is the express processes will put it into the extended ram and as and how cpu finishes execution of this processes now p10 is supposing there in the extended ram so p1 finishes its execution so from the time p2 starts till p10 starts p1 is waiting state right so it doesn't require the cpu or the main memory so what we can do is we to the extended ram get p system into the ram it tend to finish execution and p p10 finishes execution it has to again continue with p1 because it is a round robin fashion in round robin time quantum based it has to execute so it has to execute all processes in the first come first basis from the first process to the last process so when we don't want p1 when we are executing other process p1 is simply waiting so we can put it back into the extended memory or into our virtual memory and we can get the process that was not fitting into the ram and requires the cpu attention next we can bring it back into the main memory so when again uh, the next process finishes p1 is due for execution so you can before it it's uh, time for p1 to get executed you should get back p1 so that way we keep on shuffling like for example your lab system La, your uh, take your example of the lab lab schedule is how 3 hours your lab is given to you so entire 3 hours whatever you do in the lab it is your lab but after 3 hours the next batch will be ready to wait, waiting outside to enter the lab and execute their program then they will finish and they will go and then when it's your turn then you come back so in this way you all will be using the lab single resource lab which will be in time quantum so that is an exa- good example here so when you are executing you are in the lab the ram is yours the lab is yours so the process p1 if it is to execute then it will be there in the ram if it is not to be executed it is it will be going to the classroom or it will have a break so that is how you put it into the virtual memory then when again next you have to execute it you will get it into the ram so this is swapping in and swapping out so this is called roll in and roll out when you are using a priority scheduling why because in priority scheduling if a higher process higher priority process comes in for execution a lower priority process has to be removed out so that's how the lower priority process is put into this backing store this mem- virtual memory or extended memory is also called as a backing store so we put it into the backing store and then we execute the process that is of higher priority when higher priority finishes its execution we get the lower priority that was put into the backing store back into your this thing so that is why it is called call it as roll out and roll in swapping variant used for priority based scheduling algorithm lower priority process is swapped out so that higher priority process can load and execute so when you are working with priority we roll in and roll out the processes so major part of the swap time is transfer time so in this task of back there is some amount of time that is spent in removing this process removing this process is not a simple task there is a lot of issues and lot of things that you have to take care of when and how you will remove a process from the ram so for that there are certain issues and certain things that you will have to take care we will see each of them one by one and transfer time what is this transfer time supposing and the rate at which the file gets transferred is 50 50 mb of file per second is transferred so what is the total time required to transfer this it will because 
150 MB transfers in one second, another 50 MB transfers in another second, so it is two seconds. Supposing if there is a latency of eight milliseconds, what is latency? Delay. So if there is a delay of eight milliseconds, so what is the total time required? The total because it is 2 seconds and this is 8 milliseconds so 1 second is equals to 1000 milliseconds so you will get 2008 sorry uh, 8 milliseconds this is only to then you will also have time that is required to bring the process inside so what is that to bring the process back from your extended memory into the RAM so total So now, when your transfer time is so much, it is taking so much milliseconds, so total 4 minutes uh, are spent for swapping in and swapping out, what should be your time quantum? What will happen if you have only 4 as a time quantum? It is, this process is finished execution, so before it is 4 minutes, that this process time comes for execution but you require 4 minutes to swap in or swap out and again to swap in so it's a waste of time are you understanding so your time quantum should be time that is required to transfer the file to your backing store and getting it back so you should take care that your time quantum is big enough that it is, it is worth removing a process and bringing it back <coughs> so processes that are put on your backing store, a ready queue is maintained to take care of which process, which ready process is to be brought into the system back. So that is what you need to manage. Uh, so uh, swapping, what it does, does uh, the swap out process need to swap back in the same address, physical address space is one issue. So we can depend, that depends on whether the addressing is static addressing or dynamic addressing. If it is a static addressing, then you will have to bring it back to the same memory location because you cannot change its addresses at runtime. Because it is in execution, a process is in execution. You remove it and get it back. It was, it said that the process uh, was at 40008 uh, memory location when it was a program counter will be constant. So the, the, the program that is loaded at this location the last instruction that is executed and the next instruction that should be executed, all that information will be stored somewhere with this process. That entire image will be put into the system, uh, into your extended memory. It means which location that, which instruction it stopped execution, it paused and it was put into the swap, uh, into the extended or the backing store and then when it is loaded back, it should start execution from the same location. Like for example, uh, when you get a phone on your mobile while you are listening to the music, so does it start from the beginning, the song, or does it start from the point where it was called K, where it was stopped? It starts from the same location where it was stopped. So that is what happens in your process execution also. It should start execution from the point it was stopped last. So for that, it has to dump the entire map, uh, what was it, uh, program counter, what is its uh, register data, all that image is dumped into the packing store and when it is loaded back into the CPU and CPU starts into the RAM and CPU starts its execution back, it will need to restore all this image. So that's why uh, if it is a static binding, then you have to load it into the same memory location. But if it is a bi dynamic binding, dynamic binding means it was removed from here, but it can be put here now. So next time when it is loaded, it is uh, rolled back, it is put into P2, uh, into this location, some other location. So that will not cause a problem. So that is what is the issue. So uh, depends on address binding method. So if address binding is static, then you have to put it into the same memory location. If address binding is dynamic, you can put it in any location. So plus consider pending I.O. and to and from process memory space. Very important issue. I.O. Supposing the process P2 
had made a request from the input keyboard to get an input or it had sent an uh, the thing for printing printing means it will just give us a print command and it can continue its work so that's not a problem but if it is an input that is required then it will wait for that till that input comes the program has to wait till that input comes so in that case if you remove it out from the memory from the ram and if there is a buffer input buffer that is allocated in this memory the process is uh, whatever memory is allocated to that process in that process only if there is a memory that is reserved for your input buffer as a input buffer to so that the keyboard can access can access this location and load the data that you have entering into this memory location then there is a problem such kind of a process should not be removed from the cpu if the process is waiting for an input and it is using the same its own memory buff, memory address as a buffer for the keyboard then such processes cannot be removed from the system why because you may remove this and load some other program here so that program may not take this as an input buffer it may be its own uh, memory where it is storing its instruction or data so you all will rewrite that memory location so you should never remove such processes which is using a part of its memory as an input buffer so best is don't use program uh, process memory as a input buffer or a io buffer use the operating system memory operating system also has various buffers for all the io devices dedicated so whenever you request for an io the request goes to operating system operating system generates buffer space for that device and it will get the data into its buffer and when this process p2 is swapped out and again swapped in wherever this is swapped in the operating system takes care of sending handing over the data to this process because it will be knowing that this process this memory is dedicated for this process and whatever input i'll get in this location that is for this process get it are you understanding so that is what how your uh, io should be taken care don't allow the processes to have its own buffer memory uh, for io buffer allow it to uh, you should make a rule that it chooses the operating system buffer so that you can swap in and swap out if you have to make that the process has its own io buffer then you take care that it is not swapped in or swapped out whenever it has made an io request whenever it has made an io request so when io request is fulfilled that time you can remove it from the system and get it back to the ram so these is steps or these things need to be taken care so modified version of swapping are found on many systems that is linux unix and windows swapping normally disabled so some of the systems normally disable swapping in our modern operating systems if you see in our modern operate uh, systems laptops or uh, syst- uh, your computers we have large amount of ram we have 4 gb 8 gb of ram most of the time we don't need swapping because we are not loading the system with those many uh, processes so in previous generations the ram was limited and their swapping was more needed nowadays we don't require much of the swapping so started if more than threshold amount of memory allocated what do you mean by this if the number of processes are increasing and you have a threshold set for the operating system that after this threshold it can only bear so if you have a 4 gb of ram for example uh, and in that for supposing that 500 mb is allocated for your operating system remember that your operating system does not take a fixed amount of memory based on its activities and the services that it is providing the operating system can expand and shrink the memory that is required for operating system it will expand and it will shrink based on the number of services that it is providing so based on all these how many processes are there how much os resources are utilized how many pr- functions of modules of os are running right now based on that there will be the op- uh, the me- memory that will be full and empty so based on how much percentage it is full so you can have the threshold set up as 90% or 95% if 95 90% of my uh, ram is full then you start swapping the process 
till then if there is no if it is not reached the 95% of the ram capacity then don't do swapping so get the processes let them finish go out for out uh, finish the execution and leave the ram so until unless they have finished their execution even if they are in waiting state keep them in ram because that is not helping that is not harming our threshold it is not uh, creating a, a problem for the processes execution only if it is 95% full or 80% full something threshold you can set wherein if it fills so much then only you do you start doing swapping all the waiting processes you put into the backing store create space for the additional processes so that the processes can breathe disable again once again when demand reduces below threshold so when it is uh, threshold start swapping if the threshold is not there if it goes with the number of processes the ram consumption is less than the threshold then you stop swapping so all these are possible so here there is a diagram so process p1 and p2 are there this is operating system uh, will be there uh, which is called as the resident operating system resident operating system is the basic kernel of your operating system that is heart of your operating system which is always present in your ram because that much minimum is always required for its well being the system uh, control to get proper execution whatever is the amount of is a operating system that is required at any time will always be there in your ram and that is called as a resident ram a resident operating system so you swap in a process so because this process came in new process was not having enough space so you remove a one process and that's how you do swap in and swap out so one process was removed from ram and another process is put back so context switch time Uh, that's what I explained you all here. So, a 100 MB process swapping to hard disk with a tra transfer rate of 50 MB per second. Swap out time will be 2000 milliseconds plus swap in of the same size process. So, total will be 4000 milliseconds. That is four seconds of the time that is required for swapping in and swapping out. So, you can reduce uh, if uh, size. So, Based, this is basically on the amount of space that is required. For example, if you have three GB of RAM space, one GB is reserved for uh, operating system you consider, so that cannot be swapped. So this is. Some space. So only this remaining part is available. If that is three GB of memory, what is the amount of? Uh, time that it will take to swap the entire 3 GB out and again back into the memory. So I think you have computed by now. For 100 MB to remove, it takes two seconds. For uh, 3 GB, it will take around 60 seconds. 60 seconds of time is required to only remove. Then again to put back, that is 120 seconds. So it will require 20 seconds. So you need to think how the time that is required. So based on the size of that program, we are only considering your 100 MB it takes two seconds. But if it is more than 100 MB, if it is 500, then it may take more more time. So that's how we will have to calculate. So uh, can reduce if reduce size of memory swapped by knowing how much memory is really being used. So what we can do is instead of uh, thinking of it may require so much memory so i am going to swap out so much memory instead of that how much it is actually using on the system you have to check that and you have to swap in and swap out and for this you will have to take the operating system in consideration you will always have to keep the operating system updated that this is the memory means what happens is 
dynamically the programs keep shrinking and growing based on the number of modules that it will require for execution when that module finishes it will be removed so based on actually what it is having physically how much memory it is utilizing you should take calculate based on that and for this you will have to always keep the operating system updated of the system you need to make a system calls to the operating system for every memory uh, request and release so if you are accessing for asking for extra memory you make a request memory and if you are not using that memory release the memory so that you don't uh, because always uh, uh, processes ask for little more memory than actually they require because they need space for breathing so that's why they will always if they require 1 mb of data they may use uh, they may ask you for um, 1.25 mb of uh, this thing so that's how they will uh, be asking uh, more so you should always track of keep track of uh, excess memory that you all will require make a request to the operating system by saying request memory and when you finish ex execution of a particular module you remove that module from the system you make again a request as release memory so that is how you all can update the memory and you can tell the operating system how much you all are going to use at any particular of time amount of time at any particular time so that the actual memory swapping takes place so other constraints are also there pending ios i have explained you all about the pending ios if there is ios then you take care that it uses its own it doesn't use its own uh, buffer space it uses the kernel space what that is the operating system buffer so that whenever there is uh, input io any io that is requested you have that uh, data put into it the operating system buffer and the uh, input output devices because there is drivers and all of, of the operating system so that will uh, communicate with the operating system only input devices are all communicating with the operating system only data also you give hand it over to operating system operating system will take care of managing the sending and receiving of data so this is known as uh, double buffering so if you are using the kernel kernel buffer then it will be known as double buffering so standard swapping not used in modern operating system but modified version is commonly used swap only when free memory extremely low so that is what we talked about so use a threshold so if it is going beyond the threshold then you will ask for swapping if it is not going beyond the threshold then don't go for swapping so contiguous allocation uh, so what is contiguous allocation for so contiguous allocation means contiguous means always in a uh, series or uh, in this thing so no gaps in between simple words if i have to say no gaps so for example if there is a process p1 so p1 will be having supposing if this is a memory allocated for p1 and it requires some additional modules or additional pages or additional information from other and uh, functions then if it is loaded here this is the space then this is not contiguous memory allocation but if you have p1 loaded you extend this memory so instead of this location you extend it and this extra space you allocate it to p1 then it is called as contiguous memory allocation so uh, whatever memory it has you extend that only and give it memory space or you can give some other memory space if you give some other memory space at some other distant at some uh, other memory location then that will not be called as contiguous so we have to think of whether how and uh, what are the limitations of providing contiguous memory allocation so main memory must support both operating system and user processes first thing this is the dead space this space cannot be used by user processes because it is always used by a operating system so this space that is there in the ram that is the user process space so here you can put any number of processes you can remove a process put a new process in that place and you can do all those tasks here but operating system memory is dead memory it's a dead memory it because when you start your system the boot program that runs when you start your program that program loads the operating system and this cannot be touched this location cannot be touched if by chance you try to catch 
uh, you try to access this memory location and do a wrong memory interpretation here do a writing or uh, if you do a writing if you do a reading probably your program may go wrong but if you do a writing your operating system crashes so that is what happens here okay so this is the operating system this space and this is the user process space so you need to keep all these processes uh, so contiguous allocation is one early method so we initially had contiguous memory allocation but nowadays operating systems do not use contiguous memory allocation they use something called as paging systems wherein the entire application uh, process is divided into pages and which page is required only that page is loaded into the memory uh that is what we will see in our paging section so main memory usually uh has two partitions uh one is the resident operating system that's what i told you this is the resident operating system and usually held in lower memory with interrupt vector so interrupt vectors what are interrupts interrupts are when any program is running and any io device or any system component needs to raise an issue then it will use the interrupt signals or when it has to send an input when it is doing some or it finishes some task and it has to intimate the operating system that it has finished whatever task was given to it then that is called as that is sent using an interrupt signal so this interrupt signals are always having interrupt vectors these interrupt vectors will have the lower level of addressing that's why your operating system also should be in the lower addressing so that's why most of the systems always put your operating systems at lower address space not at higher address space even though there is an option that you can put it at lower address space or higher address space most of the systems prefer to put them in lower address space because of the interrupt vectors always use the lower address space user processes then held in the higher memory so in the remaining part of your memory user processes are loaded each process contained in in a single contiguous section of memory so initially what was happening is once a memory is allocated to a process a single contiguous memory was allocated to it so entire block would be given to it so relocating resistors used to protect user processes from each other from and from changing operating system code and data so we have addressed already understood this that there is a base resistor there is a limit resistor these two will get to using these two values we come to know what is this memory that is allocated to p1 so that any instruction that is trying to fetch any other location in this memory location if it is within this memory limit then it is valid memory access if this is not uh, if it is going beyond this before this memory space before base and after this limit resistor it means any of this location or any of this location or any of the operating system location then it is an invalid memory access and it should generate a trap so that is what is taken care so mmu maps logical address to dynamically and can then allow uh, actions such as kernel code being transit and kernel change rising what is this kernel transit now we i have told you that this is not the entire operating system that is loaded into your ram into the ram always only a resident operating system only part of your operating system is loaded that part of the operating system is called